Well, I think that maybe we ought to probably get started um, just because I don't want to take up any of your time. It shows it's 10.01 on my time. So I'm going to go ahead and get started if that's okay. Um, Great. All right. Well, we want to welcome everybody um, to the UMA uh, conference today. It's about people, process, and performance. And we are track A, and that is the uh, people, uh, the people track that you'll be listening to. And so anyway, um, I just want to make sure that we, we thank our spent sponsors real quickly. Uh, we have now CFO is our platinum sponsor. We have Boeing that's our, our silver sponsor. And we appreciate them and, and helping us out, uh, helping us pull this conference off today. Um, just to, to I just want to thank all the veterans if there's any that are participating and we appreciate their service and what they've done for us and reach out to a veteran today and thank them because uh, we wouldn't be here today enjoying the freedoms we have uh, without them. Um, we just want to really quickly let people know that if you have any questions, if you'll uh, type it in the chat room, and then when Sean is finished, uh, we'll have a few minutes at the end to answer any questions that you might have. And so feel free to um, type those in so that we can uh, answer all of those. Just to let you know a little bit about Sean, Sean is the Vice, Pre Vice President of Business Development at Industrial Supply Company. Uh, he's the Vice President of the Salt Lake Branch of the NAACP, a former commissioner of the governor's Martin Luther King Jr. Human Rights Commission. He's at Utah Nonprofit Association, Utah Manufacturers Association Board, former chair of the web, WEDAB at Salt Lake Community College, previous alumni council president, um, trustee, Utah Third District <laughs> Court Committee for Self-Represented Parties, Utah State Board of Education, Utah State Department of Workforce Services, Utah System of Higher Education, and the Utah State Bar Commission. Sean is a graduate of the Utah University of Utah, uh, Salt Lake Community College, master's degree, executive leadership, certification, diversity and inclusion certificate from Cornell University. And we're excited to um, hear from Sean today. Um, he will be speaking on diversity, inclusion and equity, and why these topics are important for business and society. And so without further ado, we'll turn the time over to Sean Newell. Great, I wanna thank everybody for being here today. Um, I know these conversations sometimes are very uncomfortable, but I want you to know that today we're gonna to have an open dialogue and we're gonna make sure that um, we allow your voices to be heard and your concerns to be heard. Um, I, I like chat for questions, but I've put a few spots in uh, this presentation today for us to have some live questions um, because that's what we really need. We really need to have everybody be you know, strong and resilient and, and be honest with the way that you feel about this topic. So I wanted to set a couple of ground rules here first since we're gonna go into some things that may be uncomfortable. I want you to know that this is a safe place and we need to speak openly. This is how we learn from each other. This is how we develop some understanding about each other and the way that we exist as human beings together. And none of these topics or none of these uh, things that we're gonna to discuss today are our, our finger pointing. We don't want to shame anybody. We don't want to put anybody on the spot. So be respectful of one another while we have our conversations. And again, this is an open dialogue. We want to be courageous. We want to be curious. We want to be authentic in the conversations that we have today. And we really want to make sure that we add some clarity to some of the questions you may have. This is a, this is a, a huge topic. So we won't have enough time today to do it all, but we can at least take some baby steps to get to where we want to be. So what we're going to discuss today is, you know, some of the things that, you know, as far as getting clarity on what equity, diversity, and inclusion is all about. And, you know, we want to consider these three things as being very important to leadership today. Without leaders understanding the emphasis, the, the catalyst, the the impact that these issues have on our workplace, we're gonna run into some difficulties because what's gonna happen here in Utah really soon as it is in the nation is that we're gonna have an enormous shift in our demographics. These demographics include race, age, um, generations, 
um, people with disabilities, all sorts of diversity that's going to be coming into the workplace that we have to be willing to addition to um, you know accommodate. We also have to understand that there are a number of diversities based on some hidden burdens that people have. These are things that are not visible to us. These are these are things that may exist on an on a interpersonal level for our employees, but we need to have a conscious awareness that these things may exist. We may not ever hear about all of them, but we have to understand that there are some underlying issues when it comes to diversity that we have to consider. We want to also understand that with this shift in our demographics, we have to know how to navigate the creation of a diverse environment that's inclusive of all people and valuing all people that are going to be coming into our workforce. And we're going to measure these things. Um, we're going to measure them financially. We're also going to measure them, measure them on our performance based on what our mission and values are as corporations. And these things are really critical when we talk about you know, looking at diversity, inclusion, and equity. So jumping into a little bit, you know, what is equity? Um, equity is fairness, and it's, it's not the same as equality. That's where people really get confused. Equity is adding maybe a couple of different pluses for someone that's got a number of different minuses, if, that's, if that clarifies it, to be able to put them to the same playing level as other employees or other people that are within your corporation. When we look at diversity, diversity includes any and all differences in all human beings. Most of us think of diversity based on race and ethnicity, but it goes way beyond that. And that's where we really see some struggles within our, our industries and our businesses is truly understanding that, that diversity exists in each and every one of us, even if we don't have different races, but we want to also look at the inclusion of more than just people that look like us. So the inclusion is the actual action of including people into our structure, creating policies, creating environments where people are completely immersed and are accepted and valued as individuals. This is really critical when we look at, you know, diversity and how that's brought about. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to, be a little vulnerable here and I'm going to share a little bit about myself because a lot of folks say, well, you know, how do you know about this stuff? You know, how long have you been involved with diversity and inclusion? I actually have been involved with voluntarily and involuntarily since 1968. In 1968, I was part of the third class of students that was bused from my neighborhood to an all white school. And I was part of this desegregation program all the way through high school. So, you know, when I came here in 1980 to Utah, it wasn't very hard for me to acclimate because I was really familiar with being a, a pioneer, so to speak, into areas that were uncomfortable for a lot of people that grew up in areas where most of them were minority um, majority. And um, the acclimation process for them was much more difficult. But I learned way back then that it wasn't just me that was impacted by this process that I was involved in. It was all the other people that are around me, the parents that fought to get us to be able to go to schools that had higher quality, the, the people that were against the segregation of our school system, but also ended up having to learn to acclimate and to adapt to having children that looked a lot different than those that started there coming to their school and learning how to teach them, learning how to add those elements of equity and inclusion at a very early time in our history. And I learned an awful lot there um, as to how to treat people as well. So one of the things that's really interesting right now, we've got a lot of stuff going on in our country, you know, here in 2020, especially with the social unrest, um, you know, the COVID stuff that we're going through, but there are some positives coming out of that. It gives us an opportunity to stop and reflect. You know, most of our, most of us here in this country have not really been taught the true history of our country. And this is an uncomfortable place for us. This is where we start to dig a little bit deeper into where we are as Americans. There are communities that have been marginalized for hundreds and hundreds of years, but we really don't have those conversations, especially through our education system as young people. And it's critical that we take that step back to understand where the catalyst of, of some of these angst and issues have, have evolved from. You know, 
we have to discuss the the practices of the past in our businesses. You know, there, there are issues like the Jim Crow laws that really were, you know, subjected people that were part of these marginalized groups to exclusion from being part of the actual workforce in many different ways. There are the shifts from industrialized areas to you know plants and things moving to more rural areas. So it made it more difficult for some people in some communities to be able to find transportation, to be able to have gainful employment. And we still see some of those things going on today. And for us as a country to move forward, we have to acknowledge some of these facts. We have to be willing to talk about it. We have to be willing to state the fact that we, we understand that we have biases and, and there are discriminatory structures within our systems. And we have to be, as leaders, the ones to fracture that. And that's really critical. Now, there's a hesitancy you know, to further our education because people feel fearful that they're gonna say, oh, well, you know, I'm being blamed for this. That's not what this is all about. It's about knowledge. It's about creating awareness. It's about understanding that not all of us start from the same place in this country or in this world to that matter. And we have to be willing to face those fears of knowledge. And fear to me is one of the biggest words out there. If we're afraid to learn, if we're afraid to advance, if we're afraid to go to those uncomfortable places, we negate our opportunity for growth. And growth is really critical and growth is a huge part of understanding diversity and inclusion. And to move forward, we really have to know that history. So what I wanna do next is I wanna take a couple of questions from a few of you while we've gone through some of these topics, just to get a feel of some of your thoughts and um, you'll come off of mute and we'll do, I'll give you just about 30 seconds, but I'd like to take two or three real quick questions. This is where I ask everybody not to be shy. Nothing new to anybody? So Sean, if, if you say that we, we don't all start in the same place, how do we get past um, the idea of being privileged because of where we were born or how we get past it? Um, a lot of times when, when we say privilege, um, we get defensive and there's nothing to be defensive about. It's just, an, it, it, we just need to acknowledge that we haven't all started with the same resources that each other has. So as long as we can gain some understanding of that, we can look at means and ways of helping those that have not had those resources, find the pathway to gain, you know, at least some access to them. For example, education is a huge one. If you know, if we're, if you're well educated, you've got a lot more advantages. We already know that. Most of us know that, you know, like the back of our hands. But there are some people that ended up in systems or situations that did not allow them to have the same type of education. There may have been, you know, a, a, a single parent that, that couldn't get them to the school that they needed to go to on time, or that they had a, a they may have been somebody from a rural community where they had a farm and they weren't allowed to go to class until they did their, you know, their work at, at home. And a lot of times they missed some schoolwork. So there's a lot of different things when we talk about privilege um, that we can overcome by helping others get past that and helping them with some of those resources. That's where business and industry can really jump in and do a great job. Anyone else? Sean, this is, this is yeah. Darren Brush. Your point about not having a, a, an accurate lens through which we view our history, I think is really important foundationally for how we, how we think about these things. Are there, are there tips or things you've seen for how we kind of refocus that in terms of how we, how we embrace our history? Yes. Um, thank you very much for that, Darren. One of the greatest things is, is to, you know, pick up a book. That's one of the quickest, easiest ways. The other one is to communicate with people that don't look like us or may not have had the same experiences that we have. Do not be fearful to approach people based on their differences. Most people wanna share with you because 
They want to know more about you as well. And if we can find a way to get over that fear, that angst about approaching each other and having authentic conversations, we can really start to grow. We can really start to gain some understanding. Some things you may not believe when you hear it, but you take those, those things that you don't believe and go back and do a little research. There's maybe things that you know are aha moments. That really helps us to develop those relationships. But, but communication is critical when we talk about gaining some understanding and learning about some of these things in history that we don't know about. I'm gonna take one more real quick. Okay, well, we're gonna move into what the, what's really going on here now. So one of the things that we find here going on and when I talked earlier about the demographic shift, this is just a picture of Utah. Right now, Utah has over 35% ethnic minorities that are entering into the workforce or currently in the workforce. Those demographics are gonna shift dramatically over the next few years. And this chart here was done by the Kim Gardner Institute. And you can see where these, these shifts are taking place. Now, uh, there are a number of categories here that, that aren't listed. So we really don't know what the true impact is going to be. But if you take a look at this, you can see the importance of how come we need business and industry to look at being able to understand and accommodate and integrate different cultures and ethnicities and races into your business. There's so many things that make this a, a, a critical issue. You know, we look at, first of all, who are we going to hire? You know, we have to think about things like our recruitment. You know, how are we going to recruit diverse populations? Do we understand how to recruit diverse populations? You know, there's a lot of differences in, in the cultures as far as language and, and understanding. So you have to be able to convey messages with great clarity through communication when hiring people. And we have to make sure that we're removing any of our biases that may exist. Trust me, this is one of the hardest things that, that we have to discuss at any point in time. We're not going to go into detail about it today but know that we all have biases, each and every one of us. You know, you have a bias if you don't like olives on your pizza. You know, there's, there's, there's just something there that, you know, we have to acknowledge. And it's critical that we acknowledge the fact that we don't have, you know, that we all have biases and that we have to be clear on how we can make sure we, we understand the biases we have and that we can mitigate that impact when we're looking at recruiting and hiring people into the workplace. Next, we have to think about retaining the people that we have, you know, both the new and existing personnel. Um, you know, understanding how to make cultures within a workplace that are conducive to valuing everybody, you know, to, to encompassing the differences that people bring to our conversations or our business that help our businesses grow to be stronger, to be, to be more competitive. We have to make sure that we are understanding completely how to set up the, the environment to a point where people come with their whole selves, that they're not leaving a piece of them. The conversation earlier this morning was great in talking about that in, in making sure that we understand that we have to be able to bring our full self to the workplace for people to be able to be happy there and to be able to stay. And when we have this generational shift in our demographics, it's really difficult because the gener different generations are looking for totally different things. So again, we're looking at you know, the sphere outside of simply race and ethnicity when we talk about that diversity. We also have to think about inclusion. And our inclusion is, you know, it's educating our, our, our management team on what it is and how to make decisions that, that do not hamper our progress as a corporation. We have to understand that every decision we make impacts somebody within our, our, our entity. And it's critical that we have a full understanding that we erase any of those biases that may be in policy, any of those biases that may be in the selection of people within our companies to when we're talking about promoting people or we're talking about helping people to progress in their skill sets. And these things are really, really important for us to consider. So again, I wanted to take a moment and see if anybody had a couple of questions there while we're talking about this topic here about retention about um, recruitment and inclusion. 
Um, this is Dave Wall. I've got a question about uh, the identification of bias and the removal of bias. There's, there's so many different levels within the workplace, whether it's within an organization, within a manager, uh, or just within individuals. What's the best way to approach that? How do you, how do you tackle all of that? Um, are you talking about approaching it as an individual? No, within the organization. Within the organization. I think one of the things to do as an organization um, is first of all, acknowledging that and, and illuminating what biases could exist. Because that way you get people to take a look and go, oh, maybe, maybe I've done that before. You know, maybe there's certain phrasing that they've used and they haven't recognized that that was a bias phrase or, or there were some biases built into that. And getting people to, to really be active about looking for biases. If we're not active, you know, our lens is very narrow on what we're seeing. But if we're very active, we start to pick up things and learn. This is not an easy thing to do. Um, biases exist in so many parts of our, our language and our conversations in our environments. And to be able to be effective at mitigating that, we have to have that constant awareness of language that may be biased. And it's, it behooves people to do that upon themselves because without doing it yourself, you won't be able to really open that lens up to be able to see it when it comes from other places. Did that answer that pretty good? Yes, thank you very much. Okay, anyone else? Okay, great. Well, I mentioned earlier some of those hidden biases or hidden burdens that people have. And I wanted to go through a couple of them. And some of these terms may be a little unfamiliar to you and um, it's gonna invoke some conversation. But if you think really closely about some of the hidden burdens that exist, um, they're not all mentioned here, but you may recognize that some of these things you've seen before, but haven't really thought of. You know, one of the first ones I want to mention is racial battle fatigue. This is a fairly new term, and it's actually been coined by one of the professors at the University of Utah who's doing great research on this. What racial battle fatigue is, is it's, re it's a result of these constant hostile environments that people feel from based on their race in the workplace, based on their race in, in society. And they feel these angst every day just by getting up. You know, there's, there's for an example, um, when I was a kid, we were taught that when you go to the store, you always get a bag and receipt, you know, and, and growing up in the schools that I went to, this, the other, my peers, they didn't do the same thing, but we were taught that as a safety mechanism in being a black American going to the store and not being blamed for shoplifting. So we were taught these little simple things that became burdens on us that our peers never really had. And that came, goes back to a little bit to that privilege thing that Lance said question about, you know, recognizing that, that those little things are privileges that, that some people don't have, but then they become burdens for others that, that, that don't have those, those same opportunities. What these battle fatigues are also are these inter internalized traumas. These are things that, that people feel every single day, every, every, every encounter they have, they're worried about not being accepted, not being valued, not being seen as an equal. And these things start to add up. So we're starting to see these start to come to fruition in, in the health crisis, in a lot of marginalized communities. These, these things are really critical. They're, they're visible. They're, they're, they're actually able to track that these traumas and the stress is creating a health issue. And when we look at the demographics of certain marginalized communities, we start to see increases in health disparities and stress and these traumas, these internalized traumas are a big part of that. And they bring these things to work. So these are things we have to consider when we talk about creating a workplace that's safe for everybody. Code switching. Code switching is another difficult one. It's probably a, a new, um, term for you, but I wanted to make sure I sh shared this one with you. What this is, is a this instantaneously for a lot of people that are outside of the, 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 the normal group or the, the in group um, or the predominant group within a company, they have to change their behaviors in a way that helps them to be able to acclimate to the situation or environment. 
And this again adds a lot of stress. This is something that's done instantaneously by those that have had to practice this in, in their lives. And most people outside of that individual don't know what's happening. And it becomes such a habit that it becomes internalized in that person and it becomes part of their everyday behavior. And this is all because of, you know, not being or feeling like they can bring their whole self to a situation or an environment. We really have to be conscious of this because we don't know that these things are going on, but they're happening with people within our workplace and our employees. We have to think about things like mental illness. Mental illnesses can be known or unknown. They can, they can exist within our, our employees and we have no idea. We don't know what the impacts on their health are. These things are part of these, this great variety of demographics that we have within our corporations. We have to understand that there may be some invisible triggers. If we're having an issue with an employee, there may be triggers that are making those, um, those habits and behaviors you know, start to come to the surface. And we have to be willing to ask the question to that employee in the right way to get some answers to find out. There are unconscious ticks that people have. And these things are some, one of some of the outward things that we can notice as managers or leaders that we can look to how, figure out how to address, but it's a hidden burden for that person. They may not know that these things are occurring or that they have these habits or behaviors, but it behooves us to be conscious of that. That's where we have to be really close to the people that we work for and work with and that work for us. These personal issues are becoming a bigger and bigger issue in the workplace. And it's a big part of diversity. We have issues with single parents, um, you know, mothers or fathers that, that are taking care of multiple kids that have to get them all over the place, you know, now, especially with them participating in sports or just getting into school and getting them up in the morning. We have to look at the way that we treat our, our clock hours at work. Are we giving uh, some consideration to these employees? That's when we talk about the equity side, you know, where we may, may not have to, you know, be stringent about so-and-so has to be to work at eight o'clock. We may have to in, implement some flexibility and say, well, because of their situation, we'll accept them coming in at nine and maybe they'll stay till five instead of you know eight to four. And it's easy for us to do, but these solutions have to take, take place. And we have to think of them as leaders. These caretaker concerns, you know, now with, you know, especially in this period that we're in right now with COVID, we have to think about people that are, that have responsibilities outside of the workplace that may impact their, their performance in the job. If we make a workplace that's very conducive to understanding and being compassionate and having empathy for people, we can start to develop systems and policies that you know become part of our DNA that help to mitigate a lot of these situations that are going on with some of these folks. So again, after talking about some of these hidden burdens, I wanted to just take another second and see if anybody had any questions about these. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, one of the things I'm not sure if it relates to your, what you were discussing here, but one of the things I noticed in our plant is that, especially during this political season, you walk through the plant and, you know, people would have uh, talk radio on their, on their radio next to their machine. And somebody's listening to one talk radio and somebody's listening to another talk radio. And I really had noticed that there started to be a lot of uh, high emotion in the plant between people uh, during the presidential election because it, it these you know stations or groups that people identified with you know quickly became characterized as well if you're this you're that and if you're this you're that um, how how do you you know how do you advise companies to to deal with that because you know I, I had you know seen at some point there were interactions with people where somebody would say go Trump and somebody would say go Biden and you know one person might happen to have been a mid-level manager where somebody else is running a machine um, that you know from an HR perspective really sets up a, a, a an issue for us um, how, how do you advise companies to deal with those types of issues well, that's, that's a tough one, but it's very relevant today. Um, you know, you have to be real careful 
you know, the example that you used of a manager and a, a line person getting into that conversation can become very divisive. And a lot of times in those conversations, it, it won't end just there. But the key is to get those two parties together to understand that they all have a right to, you know, whatever they believe in. But there's a point also where it becomes disruptive to the workplace. And we need to make sure that these, that's clarified. And that's a very, very fine line to walk because you don't want people to feel like you're taking sides or you don't want people to feel like, you know, their, their positions don't matter. But you want to make sure that there's some clarity there as to the degree of disruption that their mindsets or their conversations could be having. And you especially have to be careful when you have a manager speaking to someone telling them that, that they're not right by what they believe in. And those things are really tough. And that's part of, you know, getting into a, a room where there's just the three parties, someone from HR, a manager or whoever, and the two parties and getting them to understand that, hey, it's great that you have these points of view, but however, these are the things that we're concerned about. And these are the reasons we can't have these disruptions going on while we're at the workplace. And that's probably one of the tough things to do because no matter how soft we do that, people tend to walk away with animosities. So <laughs> I think it's a, it behooves the culture to be already in place that allows for those types of conversations to happen without people walking away feeling like, you know, somebody went up to them or they lost or, or that they're angry. And that's part of that long process of getting these understandings in place. Thank you for that. That's a hard one. And we do, um, I do work on that with, with companies and people, um, but there's a whole lot to it. <laughs> yeah, that's Anyone a else? I heard, I heard someone else, another question. Great. Boy, time goes by fast, fast, doesn't it? So what is the business case for diversity? You know, we talked about attracting the great talent. Um, when you widen your lens, when you're attracting people to come work for you, you're seeing more than just the, the folks that you expect, you know, through your, you know, your, a biased lens to come in and be able to contribute. Widening that lens just gives you such an opportunity to bring in some people that you may have never ever thought about approaching or allowing to work in your company that just helps you to be stronger. And that's what we're talking about is being a stronger corporation and our stronger business. You know, we want to bring in that, that diversity so that we can have greater, greater input, greater creative creativity, you know, people that have a different perspective when we're talking about problem solving, people that can help you come outside of your box and to be able to see something in a way that you never thought about seeing it before. That's where we start to see that really growth and that, that driver for having diverse thought, having diverse mindsets and having diverse perspectives in our companies. And then we have to think about also the savings and costs for us. You know, if you have a, a diverse workforce a workplace that is has a culture that's very positive, you're going to save money. You're going to have less turnover. People aren't going to leave. Um, we, the conversation before this one alluded to a lot of those different characteristics of a conducive workplace. We want higher productivity from our people. We want them to feel like they're part of a company. You know, they, we want them to feel like they're part of the team, and we want fewer lawsuits. You know, a lot of times things are said or done that are that are benign on the surface, but in reality, because of such, you know, the, the logistic, litigious season that we're in, a lot of lawsuits come about. And that is really scary nowadays. And that can cost us a lot of money as a company. So we have to think about the economic case for uh, ED&I. You know, Bringing in diverse workforces helps us to improve that innovation and that creativity that we have. We want to we want to do this not based on where we are right now, but we want to think about globally. We want to think about the impact that our company has inside and outside of our doors. We want to create those opportunities to to find new markets to be able to dive deeper into markets that we currently have and gain a greater understanding by maybe even bringing resources 
that understand those markets we want to target a lot better and those customers we want to target in a different way. We want to understand our workforce and that it is changing. You know, right now, they're saying that 44% of the millennials are of a minority race. And sometimes that's not mentioned, but that's those that's the workforce that we are in right now that is right at the core. And then we've got even greater diversity coming in from newer generations into the workplace. We have to think about our boardrooms and our leadership. You know, are we diversifying those so that we can maintain or develop some semblance of greater creativity and leveraging that in a way that is conducive and profitable for the company? We are, you know, we want to make sure that our teams can improve and make sure that they're growing both with a from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset. And diversity and inclusion really helps do that. You start to get different influxes of information from people, and you really start to see that profitability grow. So when we think about, you know, looking at profitability, everyone says, well, how can you prove profitability? One is we have to measure what we're doing as far as our diversity goes. Um, here's a diagram I wanted to show. It shows that with companies that have um, below diversity scores, which is, uh, you know, minimal amounts of diversity. And again, these are all different types of diversity. They're showing that, you know, they're not quite as profitable as other companies that are. And you can see that in this diagram. And there's a there's quite a huge difference there. And this is this is a uh, report on revenue generation. And we talk about why to do diversity and inclusion. And one of the bottom lines is, is that it's profitable. It helps you to really grow. It helps you to, to develop a, a great strength in, in the way that your company is being able to show and grow and profit, profit wise. And that's the bottom line for companies. Um, we, and the only way to get there is to have a, an employee base that helps you and understands and helps drive that, that, that goal on a continuous basis. And I wanted to make sure that, you know, you took a look at this just to kind of see what those efforts and how those efforts can pay off in a diverse workforce. So I'm gonna skip this discussion because we're running close on time and I got a lot of information I'm trying to get to you. <laughs> so how do we create and change this understanding? You know, first we have to be self-aware as leaders. You know, we've got to know that we're all in this together. Um, there's no secret about it. It's going to happen. We just have to know how to navigate it. You know, and Darren alluded it to it earlier. We have to widen that lens that we have. And we have to be prepared to understand diversity, inclusion, and, and equity. And we have to educate ourselves on that. We have to be prepared to be resilient in this space. You're going to come up against a lot of pushback as leaders and managers to why you're doing this. You know, what is the purpose of doing this? You know, what are the gains? What can we expect from doing it? But then we have to think about how we're gonna do it. And we're gonna have to do it through training. We're gonna have to go through implicit bias training to make greater understand how to do this. We're gonna have to work on shifting our perceptions, our conversations, um, how we make decisions as a company. And we do this through communication. You know, you might not always see, you know, the things the way that you want to see them, and we might not say the right things, but if we're curious about, you know, actually learning and, and we want to know the answer to certain questions, we'll gain that through our communication, and that's critical to do. And we have to think about the change. We're going to have to change structurally. This is, you know, shifting the systemic policies within your, your corporations to make a difference, you know, adding diversity to your executive positions, creating strategies that work for your company, that bring in greater greater variety of customers and, and um, improving your culture. And then we're going to measure that return on investment. You know, we keep talking about culture, but culture is an important thing, but it, culture is developed along the way. You know, we have our missions and values and, you know, those statements that we have, but are we following the, the, our mission statement? Are we following our value proposition? You know, this takes commitment from leadership. It takes the, the communication, not 
just at one place, but all the way down the line through all of your employees. And we have to understand that these also impact our external relationships. We want our culture to be seen as a positive to all of our customers, to all those that are around us. And we want to make sure that we do this through our behaviors. We want to make sure that our individual attitudes and perceptions are constantly growing from that fixed mindset to a growth mindset through our training, through mentoring programs, finding ways to, to share knowledge with employees to help them um, you know, understand what it takes for them to move forward in their, in their um, employment there with your company. And then think about the you know, employee resource groups. A lot of times these are, these are difficult in smaller com um, companies, but they're really important for employees to have a place where they can actually go and, and discuss issues that are going on and then bring those issues to the managers in a way that's not combative, in a way that's positive, in a way that's constructive. And those are really critical. So we wanna think also about you know, measuring our, our efforts. Without measuring, we don't know if we're doing the right thing. So you know, understand what your demographic makeup is in your company. Does everybody look like me or do we have people from all over the board, not just in one position or in one in one department, but throughout the company, you know, do does our workforce mirror our, our customers does it mirror the external environment in our community. Does it mirror the, the, the goals that we have to be a community partner, these things we have to be considerate of. You know, and how are we leveraging those differences to create the exceptional, exceptional performance that we want? How are we getting better as a company by doing the things that we're supposed to do, you know, based on what we say we're going to do as far as diversity and inclusion? And how is that showing up in our performance to our customers? You know, performance is ultimately that it's measured by that profitability, as we talked about before. But we want to look at the overall performance of everything. That includes our, our you know, our operations, our, our, our management, um, our accountability to our customers and our suppliers. All those sorts of things are, are really important. So for leaders, what do we have to do? You know, we have to be resilient as leaders. We have to keep in mind the objectives of the company at all times. So we're not talking about changing everything that we do, but we're just talking about getting better at the way we do those things. We have to impose that inclusive lens to our organization. We have to be willing to do this and fight those forces that are telling us, hey, we don't need to change. Nothing's, nothing's going to, we're not going to gain anything from this. We have to say, no, we are going to do this as an organization and we have to be strong leaders. We're gonna set those rules of engagement so that everybody understands from management all the way down to the, the brand new employee that everybody is a part of an effort in diversity and inclusion. We all hold a stake in this and we all have to do our part and great, gain greater understanding as we move along this path, which is not easy. And then we have to remember that we're all on this journey together. So what I wanna do is really share with you the last slide then we have only about a second this is what industrial supply company looks like this is our leadership team and i show you this picture because it's with great pride that you see how diverse we are and this was not done by mistake our chairman of the board phil thompson who's up at the uh, top left corner back in the 80s uh, he had a conversation with me and a couple others and he said this is this is what i'm going to do with this company we're going to do the work we're going to make sure that we have a meritocratic system in place where people that are qualified, people that deserve an opportunity are going to get it and they will be part of our leadership team because he understood the, imp the importance of having that diverse thought, those, the, those diverse mindsets and that knowledge that comes from different places and bringing those experiences into the workplace to make us a better team. So I really want to thank you today for, you know, listening to me because I talk a lot, um, <laughs> but also for being willing to learn a little bit more. And I just put up here on the screen just um, a couple of websites that you can reach out to myself. I work with, uh, of course, Industrial Supply, but in my spare time, I work with a company called Inclusion Pro. And then um, we do some consulting uh, with companies just to help them get a better and go into a lot more detail 
on this information that we just you know gave you a fire hose of right now. So um, I don't know if there's time for any other questions. I think we're getting close. Yeah, if anybody has any questions, um, you're free to ask them or you can type them in the chat room. Right now, now we don't have any questions in the chat room. Great. Yeah, this, this is always a tough conversation and um, I'm just glad that you know, those that are participating were willing to participate. And I'd love to be able to help you reach out to me through Teresa and I'd love to help out with anything, any questions you have, if you didn't want to have ask a question now and um, We'll make sure that we're here for you. Okay. Um, many great comments. Thank you so much. This is very timely, a very important topic. Um, everyone is very appreciative of your great comments and um, teaching us today and helping us to understand more about diversity as we all have um, different parts in the workplace that we all are very diverse and come from different experiences and and uh, I I really liked your comment about we need to widen our lens and gain understanding for each other and see the potential that we have for each other. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we're all in this together. <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you, everyone. You're Thanks, muted. Okay. I love that's the only time that people can say that I don't talk too much. Oh. <laughs> but we want to we want to thank Sean for sharing this information. I think it's been great and useful information. Um, if you are not a member of the Utah Manufacturers Association, we would love to have you reach out to us. Um, you can reach out to Teresa, uh, myself. We'd we'd love to help you with that. Um, the Utah Manufacturers Association is very big on. Uh, connecting people and connecting our, our workforce together to keep our economy stronger. Um, I do have a couple of people who have won prizes. Um, we have, I can't, can't multitask. <laughs> we have Brad Higginson, who has won a certificate from Utilitem to have them come to your company and evaluate um, your utilities to see if they can save you money along with a $50 gift card um, for you. So they wanted something for the business as well as the individual. The second uh, person that won today on our drawing is Roger Corey. And he has won a, a face mask and bamboo socks from Walt USA, All About Socks up in Logan. And we wanna thank those. And uh, if you'll just reach out to us and let us know whether you want us to to bring those to you, or if you want to come to the office and pick them up, uh, let us know. But um, any other thoughts or comments from anyone? All right, we wanna thank Sean. Um, if you're interested in attending any of the different sessions, track A is about people, track, no, track A is about people, track B is about processes, Track C is about performance, and track D is general industrial questions. And so if you have questions, general business uh, questions and uh, presentations there. So um, anyway, thank you again for attending, and we will talk to you later.